Hi everyone, my name is Naomi Stead and um, I am Professor and Head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University and I am here both in that capacity and also as one of the co-directors of PALA uh, along with Justin Clark uh, because this event and the sequence is a co-creation between PALA and Monash Architecture. As always we begin with the acknowledgement of country and on behalf of PALA I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parlour community. Um, this, as you know, this series, as you know, is called Light at the End of the Tunnel. It's, uh, this is our 10th event in the series. It perhaps has gotten a bit longer than we had expected or perhaps hoped. Um, and in the series, we look into architecture as a profession, a discipline and a practice and how it will be affected by the pandemic and specifically how we'll get out, what the light will look like. This week, I'm very pleased to say our guests are Jean Graham and Sue Wittenoom and our thematic is Together Apart. Justine will introduce Sue and Jean more fulsomely in a moment, but first, as always, some protocols for the session. As always, please make sure your microphone is on mute, but uh, we specifically invite you to leave your camera on if you're willing and if you have the broadband. Um, we really value the sense of community that comes with being able to see your faces. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, the format is Q&A. The intention is that it's both informal and informative. Um, usually it's ever so slightly shambolic, but that's part of the charm. Uh, Justine and I will ask questions and try to keep things flowing along, but we'll also take questions from the floor throughout. So please put your questions into the chat. Um, we will select some of the questions and then invite people to verbalize and pose their questions live. Now, if you don't want to do that or you're not able to because your microphone doesn't work or whatever other reason, that's totally fine. Just note it in the chat and we'll pose your question for you. Um, as always, please feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, we have found that parallel narrative that goes on with commentary and uh, your experiences to be a real pleasure of this series. So don't hold back. We want to hear what you have to say and your questions. Naturally, we won't get to all of the questions, sadly. Um, there are always excellent questions we don't get to, but they do help to inform the topic of subsequent sessions. So now I'm going to throw to Justin Clark, who will introduce Sue and Jean. Thank you, Naomi. So um, as Naomi said, um, this session to get, is called Together Apart. Uh, it focuses on the idea of the distributed workplace. And this, of course, um, for those of you who've been to some of these sessions already, you'll know that this has come up a lot of times in the preceding sessions as we've all rapidly shifted to remote working. Uh, many people see the benefits of not being in the office all the time, um, but also others have also spoken of the challenges, including the lack of informal and incidental conversations and the fact that many people, um, especially in the younger cohorts, do not have suitable workspaces in their homes. So um, today we wanted to kind of drill into that topic uh, a little more, one that's come up a, a lot of times. Here in Melbourne, of course, we're all back in lockdown. Um, and I think uh, remote working is going to be with us to some extent for a very long time. And we're look most likely um, with different levels of intensities depending on what happens in, during the pandemic. Um, so, as I said, we want to focus today on the idea and the reality of the distributed workplace. Um, we want to, now that we've all had this um, sudden and, and often unplanned experience of working remotely, we want to turn to a more considered discussion of what the distributed workplace might look like in the medium and long term. Um, and to help us explore this topic, we've asked uh, Jean and Sue to come along, particularly because they're both very familiar with the, the idea of distributed, uh, distributed office. Um, before the pandemic hit, and they bring, each bring quite different knowledge and experience to that topic. So Sue brings insight from the world of larger practice and corporate consultancy, while Jean has um, direct experience of setting up and running a very effective and highly regarded office that is also um, operates across locations. So short introductions. Sue is the founder of The Soft Build, which is a change strategy consultant. She's a registered architect with an MBA and her focus is on design for change. 
She helps clients think strategically about how the relationship between people and places shapes organizational performance. And she's long advocated for uh, distributed workplaces. So she's a former director of the global consultancy DEGW, and she was ACOM's strategy plus practice leader in Australia up until 2015. Um, uh, Sue describes to me this, the, the, um, this increased familiarity with remote, remote working as the silver lining, lining of the pandemic. And she's very articulate about how we might build on that experience um, as we develop our future workplaces. Jean, as I'm, Jean Graham is the Director of Winter Architecture, um, a small Melbourne-based practice, um, has offices, or Victorian-based practice, has offices in Fitzroy and in Torquay, and employees located in a range of places across Australia. Um, she's been evolving this practice model for some time quite organically. Um, Jean was the recipient of the National Sustainability Awards Emerging Architect of the Year Prize in 2018. And she's very articulate about the possibilities and the challenges of collaborating across geographic locations. So welcome Jean and Sue and thank you. I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Lovely to see all your faces here. Turn on your cameras if you can, as Sue said, as Naomi said. So um, to get started, Sue and Jean, I wondered if you could both each just tell us a little bit about your experiences of working um, across geographic locations and of, in Sue's case, advocating for that with your clients. Um, what have the opportunities and challenges been in that experience and how has that informed how you've managed during the pandemic? So who wants to start? I'll dive in. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the warm welcome, Justine. Right. Um, and yeah, I've got I've got skin in the game for two different reasons. So, the work my work background for the last twelve years has been advising companies on how they make the shift from a system that's all about everyone coming to one place to work, to um, giving people the freedom and the flexibility to decide for themselves. What, um, where they actually get work done. Um, and that meant helping people rethink the system of, of um, all the enablers, usually in parallel with a rethink of a workplace or a working environment. So we had a change scaffold that let people work their way through all the issues on what it meant to go distributed in a planned and logical way, rather than saying, a week before everyone had to go home, go home. So there was experience about redesigning systems. And then in delivering that work, um, we always walked the talk. So since 2008, I haven't had what amounted to a permanent desk either at home or in an office. Um, I've just moved around and sat in different environments um, or chose different settings, depending on where I was for the day. Um, and that meant thinking about how I would stay connected to the people that I was working with when we were in the same building or how we would stay connected when we're working on a project that's distributed across different cities. And the experience in the last five years of being a solo person is very much how do I plug into different places depending on what's on at the time. So my workplace model is it depends and that gives me the flexibility to be able to make the or get the right kind of fit for whatever happens on the day um, and to work out where it is on the day. So, Jean, over to you. Uh, I guess we're very similar to you in that thinking about um, choice and where you, you feel the most comfortable producing the work that you need to do. Um, so, the, we try, try and organise our office so that people can choose to come into the space or not. Um, they may work from home or they may work from a coffee shop or they may work from site, depending on where the site is. It's not particularly attached to a space or a time in a space. So a nine to five model doesn't really work. I mean, we still do work within those bounds to a certain degree, but um, yeah, if you have uh, different life um, uh, like you have family or different commitments that nine to five model doesn't always work for people. So, um, and that's part of the reason why I sort of set up the company the way that I have is so that people can um, access a platform online, 
which is not too unfamiliar now. I feel like everyone's getting on board with that and, and companies are having to dive into it and, and, and maybe actually enjoying it and wanting to continue to do so, which is exciting because I think what that means is people can be at home for a few days or be at office or if they can't get it together at home or in the office, they can go somewhere else. Like, because the, basically the, the work, we all know how to produce work. We all know what needs to be done in the different stages of the project, different client obligations, different um, needs. But it shouldn't, shouldn't mean you have to do it from the office. It sounds a bit, it just feels wrong. Like also wasteful, um, you know, when we have beautiful homes that we, we spend a lot of energy and time in, why, why don't we just not drive for an hour and, or, you know, the, change the commute. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's they're the challenges that I was trying to overcome. So the the online system that we set up is just a generic one, but we did a lot of research to get to that, and it was a Google Drive system, and um, similar to Dropbox and those sorts of things. Um, it, it, what it does mean though is that everything's in the cloud, so there's no server, there's no server in an office that you have to connect to to get information. So that's a lot faster. It also meant that. When in the old days, like last year when I was in Canada, <laughs> I could work, you know, um, and I could work when I was traveling around. But it also opens up the time scale. So if you think about it, if you've got people in Victoria that only work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Claire, who was working with us from Perth, was working uh, a little bit later because they have a uh, different timeline, that means that we would potentially be able to produce work over a 12 hour period. And if you think about it from a company perspective, if you've got people working remotely all over the place, you could potentially be non-stop and always available for your clients. And so what client wouldn't want that? I mean, 3 a.m. in the morning, I've got an idea, you send it to the architect and maybe someone answers. So anyway, <laughs> I'm getting a bit sidetracked. <laughs> yes, as someone who checks the email far too often at 3 in the morning. <laughs> So, Jean, how did you come to set up like this? How, I mean, lots of people start small practices, but, but very few people start it in the way that you, or, or certainly continue developing it in the way that you, you've done. Well, it's probably more out of a necessity. I, um, I, was working with a, I was working alone and then I uh, was, was quite a successful sole practitioner, um, but I didn't enjoy... Uh, the attention, which is kind of ironic because now I'm getting quite a bit. Um, but the the thing is, it's always like, it's always about me, like if, as a hero architect or something. And I just hate that because I know that it's about a team and we're working in all these bigger offices and knowing how they can work. You know, there's often a lot of people that the client never meet. And I sort of didn't like that either. I was like, I want a whole team to be part of the whole process and, and meet the client or go to the site or just be part of it. And so that was the frustration that I had. So I thought well, maybe I can make it different. And then also I had some frustration about, um, obviously I'm female and I just felt like there was, a, and maybe it was in my head, but I felt like there was some challenges that I couldn't overcome. And then I decided that um, after a few conversations with different friends, uh, maybe I just need to do it a different way. And then also, you know, I don't really, want to do it the other way so what would I want to do and so I sort of sort of worked out how I would like to work and then it was forced upon me in a way because I started working with some friends um, who um, were really amazing assets for the team and then they felt really sad when they fell in love and had to move into state and and then that relationship was you know they they thought it had to end and I was like well not necessarily so we just made it work and it just it, that's actually been great. So we've got our bookkeeper in Brisbane and for a very long period of time, Jack was working for us from Sydney. And then um, from oh, Claire's in Perth, um, she doesn't work as often with us, but she's more project, project specific now, but she's worked on projects completely from start to finish without even being in Victoria. And she's never even seen some of the finished projects. So it's completely amazing um, to think that you can do your job, be involved with the design, but you don't necessarily have to physically be there. It's like that you have to let go of those old constructs. And, and also, you know, a lot of my friends, female architecture, and there was a lot of struggles that I felt like and challenges that they, they came across. And, 
And I thought, well, how would I resolve that? So maybe it's just having flexible hours and then maybe it's flexible working spaces and then maybe it's um, being more logical about project management and just saying, well, if you can't actually do a whole week's worth, you can only do two days, and what can you do in those two days that's more valuable? So it's just like staff management, human resource management, but you're just doing it without having to be physically in the same space with everyone all the time. And that's where it came from. And now everyone's doing it, but everyone's, it's so extreme that the choice is taken away and that's where the problem with it comes from. And people are getting isolated and people are getting depressed and that's also a real problem. So Claire in Perth, she was working from a share space um, in exchange for, uh, their office had a staff member in our Melbourne office and it also happened to be named Claire. And <laughs> Claire is, was working with us until recently. She's just started another role. But Philip Stasebo Architects um, with Winter Architecture have worked really well just sharing spaces. So um, she was able to share and be amongst other staff members that weren't necessarily in the firm but amongst architects and designers and going out for coffee and lunch. And Jack was working from Sydney and um, we didn't, he was constantly working from home and by choice primarily because he couldn't find a studio space that would suit. But I think it meant that he became really detached and I was really concerned about his mental health and well-being because of that. And I think people need to be really careful with working in isolation, even if you're an introvert and even if you don't really like being in offices. I think it's important to have the choice to change it up because otherwise you you can get really sad and it gets on top of you before you can handle it. And we need to be aware of that as managers and just check in with people. And so one of the systems we have in place, and, and this is only recent that we've changed it. Um, so Issa and Rowan and, and James, more we've got some more males in the team, <laughs> um, but um, we actually, and Helen and everyone, we all and meet online at 9.30 a.m. We have a meeting every day. People can, check in if they want, it's not mandatory. And then we spend like half an hour just having coffee and a chat. And then the whole day you can just click back into that meeting and then someone might be there and you can just hang out if you want. But if you need the headspace and you don't want to see anyone, you just, you just turn it off. It's just making sure you can connect if you need to. That's what's that's most critical in these situations and making sure your office can work. And if you have staff or you work remotely or you're a sole practitioner, get some friends and do it together like you are a company together so that you can connect with people because, yeah, yeah, we need to stay together in that way. I think that's one of the things that, things that interests me about, you know, this, I'm, I'm sure I've said this before at these sessions, that a lot of practices that previously some of the directors were very resistant to the idea of flexible work and now that resistance is entirely gone because they, they have had no option and they've seen also that people can be trusted, that... Um, a whole lot of those barriers have been overcome. So I think the question now really is, is none of us, none of us want to work in pandemic situation on, in an ongoing way. I mean, obviously there's far too many challenges for that. So the question is how do we take um, what, what is being learnt and, and what those of you who've been doing this already do learn and kind of move forward that, with that. And so I wondered if you wanted to reflect on the kind of pandemic, um, you know, what, what, what that's meant and how you think we might project forward? Oh, um, I've, I've found this pandemic really challenging personally, um, mainly because I didn't notice, but every weekend I go somewhere, I go hiking or I go skiing or I go, I get out, I'm in nature because I've got a really small apartment that I live in that was also the office for a long time. So I just, um, I realised how important being amongst people, but not even being, can, like you're just walking down the street and having people interacting in a cafe. You don't have to talk to them. They don't need to know you're there. Just feeling amongst something. Mm. It's so powerful. And I just realized it's all gone. And it's so sad to be around. And part of the beauty of design and um, being an architect is changing people's lives and in, the, in small ways that they don't even notice, hopefully. And then um, you, you know, having a client meeting, explaining the ideas and, and, and running through it with their body language, you'd miss a bit of that with online communication. It's really hard to 
to, to get that across because it's almost like you're developing a relationship, you're developing a trust that goes on for many years and this disconnect and that isolation on top of all of this is just a, it's like everyone's a, um, emotional uh, breaking point almost and no one knows what's happening and I think that's there's no reassurance that we can give. But as a practice, um, I think the best thing we can do is have systems in place and if you are thinking about going online and having part office in, in office and part at home, um, or you know, however, what structure you want to do, I think it's important to think about systems and making sure it's all very clear and everyone has is across it. And once you streamline it, it'll take ages. It took us, you know, months. But once you do it, it will be so efficient and effective and painless. And um, it just it's like uh, exercise you've got to do a little bit every day otherwise it's a disaster you know so it's a bit like that and you have to do a lot of maintenance you have to make sure you upload regularly you have to make sure that everyone has the right programs and everyone has the capacity to work yeah and listen and talk about things and be open with each other don't just say yep I'm on top of it it's okay when it's not okay you can share things it's just because you're from home doesn't mean um, because things are different um, and for some people with this COVID um, overlay you kind of you sometimes there's no child care if, you, if your child has a, a small cough because of asthma that you can't go to, to daycare or you can't go to school and then you add homeschooling on top of that it's there's a lot of pressures and it I think maybe what some companies should be doing is actually probably putting the pressure off a little bit and maybe reducing hours and, and just say maybe putting on more people, but everyone works a little bit less. That might be okay for a little bit, because if we all keep working at 150%, we're all gonna burn out and then there'll be no one left to do anything when this all ends. So it's also what I'm a bit worried about. <laughs> so, I was gonna ask you about um, Jean's very well-made point about social isolation. So obviously, Sue, you've got long-term um, experience with this mode of working and um, presumably have encountered that challenge before. And speaking as the partner of someone who was working from home for a very long period, certainly when I would, this was pre-pandemic, I would arrive home from work and she'd be like, on me, <laughs> you know, like desperate um, for social uh, engagement of one kind or another. So Sue, how have you um, dealt with that challenge in the past? Well, in the past, and I'll say the past is the non-pandemic time. So in the, part, the good old days were when you could move around um, and you weren't stuck. I mean, that's the problem with this weird time now is that people are stuck and constrained. And that's not, an, as Jean points out, it's not healthy, it's not normal. And it's also, you know, once we get a vaccine and once we go back to some kind of semblance of normal life, you will have options and you'll have choices and you'll be able to, uh, to um, craft a portfolio of places. So even if you're in an office, you'll have different places that you like to get different work done in an office. When you're on your own or working freelance, um, I love the the quiet and the fact that I've got I've got a whole apartment to myself, um, and that I can focus and concentrate without interruptions. But when I want contact with people, I'll use it, make it one of my days to go into the hub and work at a um, work at the hub at Hyde Park, which is more around social and connection. Or I'll make sure I'm catching up and having lunch with someone. Um, so a person who works on their own and who connects with teams. I think you're right, Naomi, they have to think about how they, the degree of self-care and the degree that they support um, what they need to do their work. But in a team, and when you're working in a team, this, you know, Jean's point is well made around, you have to think through um, how and agree how you're going to make it work. And this was one of the stages that in designing systems um, for larger working environments, this importance of a team um, making sense of the situation of the workflow, of how it stays connected to track WIP, how questions get raised, how informal social connections are made, how people are mentored, um, rather than that just happening by default because you used to be all sitting together, um, you have, and by osmosis and that mentoring and everything happening by osmosis, you have to be more intentional when you're either on your own or you're in a team that's distributed. And you have to work out and agree how are the ways that you'll structure your days, your weeks, your projects, um, so that you still 
have those connections because you, you need those connections. And even a tiny fraction of companies now that are completely remote um, and that have designed never to have an office or never, uh, never to be co-located have rituals that bring everybody together. So they might have quarterly events or there might be monthly meetings and catch-ups. But people recognise that you form connections with people together in space and in settings where you can interact. So you need that rich, that rich layer of, of opportunity to meet. And you need it at the beginning of projects or you need it when you're trying to woo a client. Um, again, when you don't quite have that working relationship that lets you make assumptions that we can make when we're online like this. Um, so down the track, you know, it's, you know, the next, the silver lining that we're coming back to is, is not more of this all of the time. It's thinking about just as much as this that we want to make us happy and focused and productive and then back to the good stuff that, that is in a work environment. Mm. So one, two things keep coming up in all of this, one of which is this sort of what concern about the loss of incidental encounters um, and the other is, is really a concern about, well, there's other things, but the, the other one is the main one is a concern about how um, younger architects or, or graduates learn because I think so many um, so many of us have learned so much just by sitting in the office and hearing those conversations with consultants that we weren't even part of, but just the, the stuff you pick up by osmosis. Um, so assuming that we're not going to be staying in this, we are going to be moving into some other you know, range of models, which may include um, a degree of remoteness. I wondered what advice you have around those two things, the sort of just the incidental chat that sometimes really great ideas come out of and um, how we bring up um, less experienced people, um, particularly, I mean, a lot of architects are very attached to all being together in the same space and that that's the only way to learn. I think, Jean, you've proved very clearly that that's not the case. Um, but I just wondered if you both had something to say about those two things. Well, um, I think that uh, we're still sort of grappling with how to do that. I think the reason why uh, Claire and Jack and Helen and Cara probably work pretty well remotely and Emily is because they're, they're at a level of knowledge that is quite high, like a competent level. Mm. Uh, with, whereas with uh, the students or the graduates um, we've had, they're probably more, they are more involved usually, they sort of shadow a lot. Um, but online at this time, it's really challenging to do that. And um, so particularly with students or graduates, I, I, they come with me to site and take minutes and things. And so they're very, like, it's a slower learning process, but it means that they're sort of following. Um, and, but with online, like when I mentioned before about the uh, one mechanism could be that online group chat that's constantly going on in the background. So if you're working from home, you could leave it on with the sound, but maybe a little bit lower. And you might still hear a passing joke or, or whatever, a conversation that's going on. And if there is something deep going on with a contract or something kind of scary, often if you're trying to handle those situations, as a, even in my position recently, I've had challenges where we couldn't get glass across the border because they were denied. And then the client's really stressed out and I have to think about really clear, clever ways to communicate with suppliers who are very stressed out. So getting the team on an abuse situation and then just watching me write the email and helping me word it. It's as simple as that. Like sometimes we all just need some help and being available for help and knowing that you can ask. So I think a lot of the fear with people working from home is, oh, I better not call because I don't know if they're at lunch or I don't know if they're around, like there's that sort of not knowing and then you don't and then it's sort of every week it gets bigger, the gap. So if you contact each other every day and you get used to it, it's sort of easy. And then you can also understand their tone if it's a bad time because they'll be like a bit short and you'll be like, okay, I'll call you later. So you, you get, it's like more personable. But it's, just, it's a study of understanding and just pass, uh, like passively learning as opposed to forcing it. Like, we're going to meet at 2 p.m. today and we're going to do this. You can't really do it when it's like this. You have to be much more fluid. I'd be interested to hear from some of the younger people um, here about their experience. Because I look at my 20-something daughters and they are so good at staying connected with their peers at 24 hours a day and that, that you know there's nothing that is not shared or processed or debriefed 
among um, kids coming out of school and at uni these days. So at a peer level, I think there are extraordinary connections that are happening. And I think the rest of us, um, now we've got so many more of these integrated comms platforms, you know, like a Slack channel, or um, it used to be that the Cisco's and the WebEx's were a bit sort of, um, weren't as widely accessible, but Teams, Microsoft Teams is everywhere now. So everyone's got a chat function. And I think right now all the older people and the people who are not as fluid in a digital environment should be getting up to speed with those kinds of informal conversations and that help. Um, so I, I think that would be one thing to explore. The other thing too, again, looking at the, um, um, Andy, my daughter who works at Deloitte, not only does she have someone who she reports to in a performance management sense, but she has a coach as well too. So industries and professions where you are forming and reforming people in project teams constantly, and you don't have the advantage of people um, co-located in a group or a project team. They think more about the mechanisms that support people um, and that make sure that there is a structure around um, uh, briefing and debriefing of projects um, and of staying connected. And, and they look at, you know, they also find ways uh, of more social ways of actually um, staying connected to. And, and, I, and I've seen lots of great examples of people doing really daggy fun stuff um, on Zoom and on different platforms, which I think has broken down a whole lot of reservations in older people around, oh, I could never manage teams like that. I mean, for start, they've just had to, if they want to keep place the doors open and, and people operating. Um, and I think many people will have been surprised about the range of different things that they have um, or the ways or mechanisms that they've got of connecting. It's, you know, that really is the advantage of this huge experiment. Mm. I wonder on that note, whether we could throw to Nicole Hardman, who's made a really interesting and good point in the chat. It's less a question, more a comment. Nicole, do you want to put that? Um, actually, Nicole has just said she's had to run off. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, Nicole's point was um, <laughs> that one good thing about virtual meetings is that you can include graduates and younger staff members in the meeting that otherwise wouldn't be involved. So maybe, uh, which is a very good point, uh, maybe from that we'll, we'll throw to the question from Nishal um, Narula about um, motivation, for, especially for young, more younger, more junior staff. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, so I always wonder, like, being a student, I think this is something I face sometimes. So I am in my final year now, and sometimes it feels that architecture is so hands-on that, okay, we are tr trying hard to transition everything online, but not everything can go online. And then sometimes it's just hard to really push yourself to do things. For example, in Melbourne, I think now the restrictions are much harder. You can't go visit the site, feel the site and experience it and then come up with a design intervention. It's just that one small example or maybe access studios. I wonder if people working in the field also feel the same and how if they feel it, how do you go about it? So you're concerned about ways to keep motivation up, is that right? Is it something that is common in offices as well, or it's just students, probably? So, would you have something to say about motivation, keeping motivated? Um, well, the, it, the motivation is to stay productive and, and stay uh, constructively engaged with work. And so I think, yeah, well, I think it's it's great that we're experimenting. Um, you, you can't deny the fact you pick up any paper or you read any bit of economic advice and you think, you know, um, there is a very nasty period or, or you know, really tough economic period um, ahead as well. So I think the, mo you know, the motivation is to position yourself to, to be able to stay part of the profession <laughs> when things get really tough. Um, yeah, I you know I think I think we all we all want to stay uh, keep contributing. We all want to keep learning. We all want to keep being part of it. So I think the motivation is finding a way to not be um, to not be disabled by this, but to find a new way to work out how to thrive because there's so many important challenges that we can solve, 
as we're working through all of the, the constraints that COVID is throwing on us that are important for much bigger, longer term reasons. But I think we all experience times when we just can't be bothered working. It might be for an hour or two. <laughs> and I've got to say, as someone who's worked at home for a long time, you know, there are some days where I seem to just work incredibly productive the whole time and other days when really I'm just not nearly as productive as I should be. And right now I'd actually really like to be going and watching my builders in the sunshine, but here I am. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> I, I think I would like to say something about that actually. Um, I think motivation is driven by um, this. So you know how there's this work-life balance thing, right? People talk about well, I wonder if it's because you probably don't have the space to do the creative things that you would like to be doing. Because part of the problem with architecture, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just the way it is, is that in design, in studio, in the university, it's like all about ideas and thinking and making and creativity. But in the office, often as the graduate, you just have to do all the crappy bits, you know, like um, writing minutes or what seem like boring tasks, like calling a specifier or getting information from here or there and it's all a bit boring and it's not very designer and it's like, well, you studied for five years and what am I doing now? Um, but what I think it is, is once, once you've been there for a few years or you've seen a, a projects at different stages, you start to realise how critical all those little bits are because at the end, that means that the doorway, for example, might all line up and everything is neat. And when you walk through, it's amazing. And it's because you did this and this person did that. And knowing that, I think, is important. And that's how you try and keep the motivation up. Because the other problem with architecture is it's a long game. So there's no, like, instant reprieve. You can't get, like, yay, I did it. It's not never going to happen. It goes for years and years. So you need to have small milestones and you need to be able to have... Um, goals. So each week, maybe it's like, okay, yeah, I did this really well, or I made sure I filed all my emails away, or I did like little things, and that, that will try and um, pick up your motivation. Another thing is um, you, the way you dress and the way you integrate with people in the office, just challenge yourself, like, you know, uh, change it up a bit, and, and, and that might help keep, keep you going. And it's uh, keep your me mentally stimulated so you feel more motivated. Yeah, I hope that helps. I don't know. <laughs> there's, some, there's a very interesting discussion in the chat about motivation. Um, oh boy, which one of these will we choose? Um, maybe Anita, would you like to pose your question? Anita Morandini. Hi there. So, guys, I'm really interested in this way of working and whether you're seeing that you're being presented with opportunities that you would not have accessed previously, like work opportunities overseas. Is that something that you're experiencing? Hey, Anita. Um, lovely to see you. Um, well, not yet, but I wouldn't rule it out. Um, Certainly, um, the, 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 volume, the, the volume of, um, of webinars and of access to people and ideas globally in the last five months has been phenomenal. It, it would be really interesting to see if this translates into a more global work environment. Um, it's entirely possible. But with that also comes the increased field of competition. So it's double-sided but yeah I'm, I'm just interested because it doesn't seem like it there's traction in this space yet although we've got these forums that are bringing us globally together you, you're trying to think well how does that convert into a potential opportunity for the industry you, know, you watch external parties coming into this city building buildings you know and you think, well, how do we reach outward? Yeah. So, um, it I, I it comes down to collaboration, probably more than, so than any us. Like, for example, I'm not going to go, I'd love to work in Switzerland, but it's unlikely that I can be bothered getting registered and deal with all the complications over there. More likely to team up with someone amazing, like Peter Simpson. Yeah. No, <laughs> but um, in other words, 
the probably the best way to do it is to open yourself up to being flexible within your way of practicing so that you can team up with somebody or someone that or an office that might work properly probably for what you know what the goals are and there's no reason why we can't work internationally it's just it's not being it's just a path un, unknown mm. I wonder if we could throw to Annie Heaney's point. We're sort of coming back to motivation a little bit. Annie, do you want to make your um, point? Annie, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think on um, Neshel's point that by going online, and it probably ties in with Jean as well, is that um, she's put together a whole lot of really good systems and communicate clearly takes a lot of care and keeping everyone in the loop. I think just by being in an office can make us a bit lazy and we can kind of just assume that, well, some people assume that proximity means that people know about what's going on when in fact those poor students probably get left in the corner and, you know, I think it's making us have to make a bit of an effort and have the systems in place. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, because I think there's often an assumption that I think you're right that because we're we're together we're communicating, mm. we're mm. and, and mm. I think that that's you know that is an, an assumption which is uh, I'd say probably not true all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think but then, we're we're yeah. assuming that it's happening by osmosis yeah. and and that you know people will just lap it up or listen or or. Um, you know, the, the lazy way to induct someone or to bring somebody on board a new hire is just to make sure they sit next to somebody who can, you know, you hope will keep an eye on them. Wouldn't it be better to have someone who's intentionally checking in, supporting, providing advice and having a structured kind of onboarding process that, that brings them in? Mm. But then I actually, think that, I think that brings it back beautifully full circle because um, Sue, when you were talking before about the need to be more intentional in terms of checking in and, and building that into the structure of a project, that all takes work, right? And I mean, it's important because then, as you're saying, Annie, it means that the communication is actually happening. But for the people who are setting up the structures and being intentional, it's extra work, which can be quite hard to, on top of everything else, things that felt like they're organic or automatic or osmotic or whatever word you want to use, felt like that before, felt effortless and are now very effortful. I mean, speaking from personal experience, it does affect your motivation because you're like, oh my God, this is so much harder than anything has ever been before. So how does one, I mean, I guess it's probably a, a growth mindset thing that you reframe that additional effort as an investment in relationships. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. And if you, if you think about, you know, back to those organisations where we were setting them up to be distributed teams, it wasn't that, you know, one person would be at home or, or working flexibly. It would be that all people in that team would have the, the capacity and the ability. So then you've got a group of people orbiting each other like satellites. You really do need to rethink the support system and mechanism that, that connects them all. And I, your point, Naomi, yeah, it is in the first instance convening that conversation and working through how is the system of awareness and presence and coordination going to happen when it's not because you're sitting around a bench. Um, so you do need to design it. And as Jean points out too, that takes time, it takes effort. But again, I think it, 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 the evidence is that it's a learned behaviour, it's a practice behaviour. It's kind of like, um, you know, learning to ski, uh, that you know, all those things that are painful and hard um, and, uh, and need a lot of support and coaching and practice that when they're absorbed and unconscious, you don't hit the trees on the way down the hill because you just know how to respond. So a bunch of people know how to coordinate and work with each other. So it's a change process to implement that kind of system. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if that takes us back to an earlier question from Jessica Hyde. I don't know whether you're still there, Jessica, um, about more senior team members perhaps not wanting so much to engage in virtual meetings. Are you still there, Jessica? Yeah. 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 Do you want to Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's an issue we've had because we're a team of about 30 um, and our senior principals and directors sort of are very gregarious. They like to do things in person. One of them doesn't use his calendar. He just has a um, diary still. So having us all shift out to home has been a real challenge because they don't want to participate in the virtual meetings. They find it really difficult. They find the technology really hard. So 
yeah, I think that's been a bit of a disconnect that we've found between the maybe the junior team members, like others have said, are quite technologically savvy. They're really good. But yeah, getting the senior people to also be involved has been sort of the crutch for us. So, <laughs> so I don't know if anyone has had any similar experiences. <laughs> How do you take this is, you know, how do you give anybody, um, uh, how do you look after any ego and give constructive feedback? One of the mechanisms that might be possible um, in this particular situation is, is because everyone's been thrown at home and, and everyone's been, um, uh, had to absorb these without very little planning, uh, it would be a great idea to make sure that firms have some kind of feedback mechanism, some sort of survey, some sort of debrief, some sort of review, um, that gives everybody a chance to say, well, how's this been for you? And how's it been working? And what was great? And what do you want to keep more of? And what did we not, what didn't work that we should improve? Yeah, I think you've got to have some kind of um, sense-making exercise of this kind of experiment to be able to tactfully and productively point out where are the training, coaching, um, and the areas that you might need to tweak. And Jessica, it sounds like you're managing up with that in that as well. <laughs> and one of the things, you know, we're busy analysing the results of this um, giant survey that many of you took. Um, and one of the extraordinary results from that is the, uh, we asked people how they felt their workplace had, was managing the, trend, the sort of challenges of COVID. And a very high proportion of people thought they were managing them fairly well or very well. Um, and we'll have more data on that soon, but we were um, pleasantly shocked by that. It might just be the cohort of parlor people who answered the survey, um, but there did seem to be a sense that people felt their workplaces were at least trying. So um, very pleasing to hear that anyway. But uh, yes, I think, uh, Jean, do you have any tips for Jessica of how to manage up and get her? <laughs> Well, I was going to say before, I think um, it's taken a lot of effort for, for me uh, personally to try and uh, let go, really. So I think probably for your managers and the people, you know, the guys that are struggling to get on board with it, uh, I think it's just they just need to let go and they need to actually delegate. And it's so hard and that's part of, so maybe when you're saying about managing teams, it's really hard, it's like extra work. But what you're going to think about it is, um, even though it might take a little more to train the, yourself and the team, you know, it'll end up being that they can do it and you don't have to do it anymore. And then you can do things like the drawing or the bits you like, whatever that is. It could even be specification writing, I don't know. But basically what it is is basically maybe Jess you could approach them and say look I know this is really stressful and really hard but if we tackle it now then you'll be able to free up your time to do other things that you, what have you always wanted to be able to do now you can it's kind of like maybe turn it into an opportunity as opposed to a dread because no one wants to learn new things they want to just get on with it but as we all know you can't keep going you know, you can't use your old digital phone anymore. You have to use a new phone. So you just got to move with the time and eventually it gets easier and it's awesome and then you love it and then you've got to be able to grow. Uh, so, yeah, maybe just frame it in a new way. Like if you do it this way, then you can have Fridays off and spend it with your family and then they might actually like that more. <laughs> yeah, no, I've definitely been doing that. We did a survey and also, um, yeah, I've kind of, yeah tried to take over a lot of the stuff that I don't like doing <laughs> um like you're saying so that has helped a bit but yeah it's still been that issue of um yeah getting consistency I guess across the team that they're still like joining in on things and yeah that's been the challenge but yeah no just something to keep um pushing at I guess <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder um Kim Baisley our old friend and former speaker in this series has a really good question about Presenteeism. Kim, do you want to put your question? Um, sure. I just, um, I think it's such a difficult thing to overcome that we measure um, performance and productivity by hours that you're visible in an office. And I wondered if Sue and Jean could just speak a little about the, um, the methods that they've introduced um, in your own organisations, but also Sue in the organisations that you've consulted with about how to change that mentality and um, different ways that you've uh, worked out how to measure 
and monitor productivity and performance in a distributed environment. Because um, mm -hmm. it's such a challenge for managers, I think, um, to kind of, you know, there's that sort of panicked fear that people out there aren't doing what they should be, they're online gaming or something instead of working. So how do you, how do you change, manage that process? I think, I mean, I, thanks, Kim. I think that that the the whole work from home thing has really blown up in that urban myth that I can't trust people to do stuff remotely and that they'll be, you know, they'll be skiving off of the, or, you know, they'll be avoiding the work. The, the question is always uh, in a workplace situation when people say, how can the, you know, how can we prove that the workplace will make a difference to productivity? And the first question is, well, how do you measure productivity now? And if a firm only has the metrics of saying, well, they turn up at eight and then they go home at six, so I know they, you know, they are present. That's, you know, there's a whole world of problems to unpack there. You've got to manage by outputs. You can't, you can't plan a project by allocating hours. You've got to plan and deliver a project by actually what you need to deliver and when you need to deliver it by. So you, all of these things revolve around managing for outputs and for performance not for hours of presenteeism. Um, as a manager of teams, I fall into the trap of looking at the design and wanting to do everything. And then I fall into the trap of getting other people in the team to do it and then trying to measure how much time they're spending because you're also billing clients and they're spending money on these projects. So you have kind of got this crazy dynamics of everyone's needs that you try and measure and then you end up with this like maybe 30 hours for this project in schematic design. And there's a real problem with that. And I'm really trying to learn how to separate myself from it. So what I've done is actually given all the money stuff to the bookkeeper because I can't deal with it. So what I'd like to prefer to do is actually just focus on the needs of the project. So, and, and also what we'll find is with team and with anyone, like if you're at different stages and you've never done that stage before, it's gonna take you longer. So if you think it'll take three hours, it'll probably take nine, that sort of scenario. Whereas if we, so when we pigeonhole staff and say they, they need to produce outcomes in a certain amount of time or measure them like robots because we're all human and we have life experiences every day, I think that's a problem. So if we measure it by deliverables, say we know in meeting with the client in two weeks, we need to have this sort of thing done by then and also provide them with a, um, an escape route. In, in other words, um, you're responsible for this, but if, if we need help, you let us know and we'll have these people available to get you through it. So that's the only way I think we can do it. And then eventually we might even end up with a quicker solution and then we have more space to do something else. So I think it's if we focus on the deliverables and we're not worrying about money and overheads and time, our time, then we're, we're more free and we can think the way we're meant to think, which is to be designers and uh, use the other side of the brain. <laughs> because yeah we get stuck sometimes it is it is really challenging though to break that nexus particularly w when you're in a professional services context charging by the hour or you know the deliverables are often measured in terms of hours and uh you know that's why we all um have to keep timesheets so mm -hmm. accurately but yeah it's i think there's a massive culture shift in needing to like how to tackle that because there's presenteeism, but there's also that, as you say, that um, that sort of understanding of how long something takes. And if you just make it purely about deliverables, then you'll end up with people working too much um, <laughs> and to try and get it to happen in a certain time frame. So we, we try and only work like certain hours of a week. We don't we don't work over that. We try really hard not to work over time. I'm a big culprit of doing that, and I'm trying to. To, to calm, calm it down. But essentially, like, you know, realistically, we need to be able to, to uh, have a life. And I think if you function better, if the task you're set isn't gonna be well achieved in that hours, like Justine, if you just desperately wanna be out there in the garden with the builders, then why don't you just do that? And then you can work a couple of hours extra over the course of a few weeks, you know, to make up for it. Like, I mean, why are we denying ourselves life? pleasures when we have like work shouldn't be a problem it should be fun and we should try and make it fit with us our needs the problem is we're so attached to, to feeling like if we're not in a space 
we're not doing any work. But if we're in the space and we're not thinking, then we're not doing any work anyway. So why are we there? Mm. Um, we are very close to the end. Justine, do you have a last brief question for our speakers? Um, well, what I, I, I've got lots of questions, but the one I'm most interested in um, is really in terms of um, as we start to go into some other version of our lives, which may be, you know, not quite so pandemic focused. What sort of advice, I know a lot of people in the audience here are not, you know, they're not directing practices. Some of them are, and I'm very happy to see you there, but then they're, they're not all. So for people who we've asked this of other, other um, speakers too, for those who are interested in a more kind of flexible um, work life into the future, and need to kind of negotiate that with their employer, what would you say to say that people, um, uh, what strategy or what kind of arguments would you recommend people use to um, raise these questions with their workplaces, especially now that most of, that, that everybody has already had some experience of working remotely. Mm -hmm. But for those who, I mean, I, I certainly know uh, in some city, in, in some parts of Australia, where you know things are, are much less constrained than they are here in Victoria, I've certainly heard from people who are a bit disappointed that um, things seem to be just going back to how they were before, rather than as Sue's talked about the sort of silver using that silver lining to kind of project forward. I think any kind of a business case. Um, for this sort of thing needs to tackle it at the individual level, the team level and the corporate level. So at the individual level, you need to know what makes you happiest and what makes you most effective as a person. So what brings you joy? What makes you, what lets you um, produce your best work and what are the circumstances? And I think, you know, reflect on what you've learned in this sort of period and, uh, and try and un unravel and unpack um, what works best for you. Think of that, not simply in your own selfish terms, but in terms of how that makes your team more effective um, and how the person who you report to gets, um, uh, is, is more effective by you getting your work done better. And then make the argument in the terms of what matters to the organisation. Is, is there an overarching driver of being more sustainable? Is it of being more inclusive? Is it of supporting more diversity? There, is a, there will be some kind of overarching logic about what makes your practice, your firm, um, successful or where you are heading, how can you express the arguments of what works best for you, your team, and what meets the needs of the broad organisation? I think that would be the, the way to, to get the argument home. Excellent. Jean? Well, I would just say have an open conversation with um, your peers and, and your um, superiors and just basically say, you know, have, a, have that conversation about what you prefer and how you would like it to be and it doesn't have to be fixed and I think there is an opportunity a lot of people just went straight back after lockdown for the first time I think that um, maybe if you just you compromise on a few days and you tell them which days and then maybe it becomes like a um, you can shape it around that uh, a little bit more because I think once people get used to it it'll become more ingrained behavior but if it doesn't work with the culture of the company then it might not be a good fit if it doesn't feel right anyway but if it is and it's working better and you feel like you're more productive and you're getting more out of it and you're finding joy in your work then that's 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 the best part about all this which is <laughs> all right. I say that we had to go through this horrible shake-up to feel like we can be a little bit more free I wonder also if there's an argument about um, uh, future proofing to some extent, because certainly, um, you know, unless some miracle vaccine arrives immediately, um, there's the likelihood that we're going to go through, you know, changing levels of um, um, need to be remote and not um, that are outside of our control. And certainly I know the Victorian government and, um, you know, uh, people putting bids forward for work are now being required to explain how they will operate and be able to deliver services in, you know, should lockdown occur again, which it already has. So I think, um, you know, that's a rather more um, cynical view, but I would suggest that it might, um, that, that there could be an argument there too about ensuring that the, the, uh, um, the company is able to be um, adaptive as we, go into this future that we don't really know where it's taking us. Resilience. That's what we're up to, Justine. That's yeah. 
cool. That was just me jabbering on, really. Naomi. I would like to thank our two spectacularly intelligent and articulate guests, Jean Graham and Sue Wittenoom. Thank you very much. It's been fabulous. <laughs> round of applause, round of applause. Um, yeah, that's it, I think. Thank you. Well, we'll have another one next week. We don't quite know the topic yet. I've got a few things in mind, um, a few speakers in mind. I just need to get the ducks all lined up. Um, I'd usually try to do that by Tuesday, as I think most of you have noticed. Um, um, and I mentioned briefly that, that we're going through the results of the survey um, and Jill, Jill Matthewson has been doing sterling work on that. Um, and we're going to take over our own Instagram account next week and start sharing some of the preliminary results there. So, um, um, and our next student and grad sort of catch up event is this Monday too. So um, for those of you who fall into that um, group, please come along, um, um, details on the website and we'll just keep on going. And thank you, Sue and Jean again. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. you for coming. Nice to see you all again.